Jeffrey. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome everyone. George Hoover gave me another one of his DJ introductions, <laughs> and uh, I appreciate it. Uh, welcome to the Pittsburgh Simply section, and um, I'm glad you've made it here. Um, I, I'd like to uh, tell you that this meeting, like all the meetings in SIMPTI, are virtual. Uh, the good news is you can go to the SIMPTI national website and see all the meetings from all the sections. Um, and uh, that's a, a real value these days. Um, you know, if you haven't joined SIMPTI at this point, uh, please do so. And I'd like to give a quick thanks to all the section managers, Bill Bennett, George Hoover, John Luff, Ed Fraticelli, Dan Turk, uh, Mike Janatis, and Greg Abel, some of whom uh, can't be here tonight. Um, this presentation tonight is a good one. It's a rare one where one person embodies a whole bunch of engineering and a whole bunch of artistic production, and that's Glenn Przeworski. Uh Glenn and I have uh, kind of had a common thread. We both lived in uh, the... Uh, Space Coast in the Cocoa, Cocoa Beach area. Um, our parents worked at the Cape. Uh, we both went to Cocoa High School, although we didn't know each other. We both went to the University of Florida, although we didn't know each other. We both worked at TPC. I don't know. Do we know each other at TPC, Glenn? I, I knew, yeah, you worked in audio. <laughs> okay, think, right? that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, this this will be a very interesting one because uh, a lot of people have younger people have no idea of how we got to the film look in video utilizing 24p so without further ado glenn it's all yours i'm, I'm gonna really enjoy this uh, particular meeting presentation okay well, I certainly appreciate the fact that uh, Simpty and, of course, John Humphrey asked me to do this. And uh, anyway, um, the presentation I'm going to do is called The Transition from Motion Picture Film to 24P Digital Imaging in uh, Television Production. And I thought before I start on that, since you're probably wondering, how does this guy who directs and films TV commercials, and I've done that for 50 years, believe it or not, how does he get involved in the electronics end of television in addition to the creative filmmaking end of television? Well, anyway, I thought I'd put together uh, a couple quick minute or so to let you know how I got that background before we start into it. I, was, uh, I grew up in the 50s and 60s in Cocoa, Florida, and Cocoa and Cocoa Beach, that whole area, everyone that was there was there because their dad worked at Cape Kennedy, or back then it was Cape Canaveral, and um, my dad was no exception. He was one of the motion picture cameramen working for RCA. Now, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, RCA is the Radio Corporation of America. They don't do movies. Well, RCA had the contract back then to do all the technical documentation at Cape Canaveral, and technical documentation included telemetry, and it also included motion picture photography. And it wasn't unusual back then that they would have oh, 50, maybe even 60 separate motion picture cameras of every format you ever heard of, 35 millimeter, 70 millimeter, 16 millimeter. And those cameras were, most of them were locked down cameras. Like the one you see my dad there is loading a uh, 70 millimeter Mitchell to photograph the bottom of an Atlas rocket as the engines start up. And uh, right behind him, is the explosion proof housings that go over top of the camera. And um, so anyway, that was, um, <laughs> that was his job. And so I was around and hearing about cameras all my life uh, based, based on my dad. Now my real love when I was growing up was electronics. And we, believe it or not, in eighth grade in junior high school, we had an electronics club. And there you can see me sitting there with my ICO oscilloscope that I built myself. It was a Christmas present and my Heathkit uh, vacuum tube voltmeter and my Heathkit uh, little signal tracer. And I decided for my 10th grade science fair project to build a television camera from scratch. And um, my, dad was <laughs> my dad was able to get me a couple, there were 7038s, I remember them. They were one inch 
Viticons made by RCA, and I actually put them in a sleeve and wound by hand the deflection coils, the vertical and horizontal deflection coils, and then that whole assembly fit inside a toilet paper tube, which was wound to become the focus coil. And uh, the camera actually worked. It, here you see me standing there with it at the um, at the uh, science fair in the gymnasium. That's my parents' uh, Zenith uh, black and white TV from the living room there. And uh, so anyway, I didn't win anything at the science fair. I, uh, an, an actual girl who was one of the uh, one of my classmates made um, she made uh, penicillin from moldy bread and so she won and probably she deserved to win but at the same time throughout high school we made movies and we had a group of four guys and we made these little three four five minutes sixteen millimeter films and um, each week everyone got to decide what they wanted to do and who would be the story writer and who would be the director and who would be the cameraman and uh, it was just a great time. I did that all the way through high school, and uh, it really helped me develop an interest in both the uh, electronics end of things as well as in the uh, cinematography and photography end of things. Here you see me editing film with one of my friends uh, on my parents' uh, dining room table. So anyway, that's, that's kind of how I developed this dual interest in the electronics part of television and at the same time the um, cinematography and photography. Now I got my, the, we started actually making 24P seriously at the, uh, in 1989. That was when we really got into it and you'll hear about that in a few minutes. But I thought before we do that, I wanted to go back 48 years and let you know some of the things that that actually triggered me to become almost obsessed with the idea of, of making some sort of television picture look like it was film. And back then, I was hired as one of the television commercial directors at a company called Television Production Center, or TPC as it was called, in Pittsburgh. And TPC was an amazing company. The uh, When you think about it, if you took a, 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 a map of the states, from Philadelphia and you drew a line all the way to uh, Detroit, Michigan, TPC was the only broadcast quality videotape uh, full production company, an independent company in that entire region. I mean, that's literally almost unheard of. And that includes uh, the city of Cleveland. Cleveland didn't have any. Now, of course, any city that had TV stations between the noon news and the evening news, they always allowed ad agencies to go in and tape some local car dealer doing some sort of, uh, you know, TV commercial there. But as far as an independent facility, TPC was the only one. And uh, <laughs> you don't appreciate how complicated that is, especially young people, because today you could take your iPhone and a small laptop computer and you can actually do far more than we could do with five million dollars worth of electronics back then and uh, you know it, it's just hard to believe what it took back then tape machines cost seventy thousand dollars each and in today's world that would be about three hundred thousand dollars and the cameras were in the 60s, 65, $70,000 also on the TV cameras. So anyway, that was, um, that was the world that I was in in 1973 as a uh, young TV director. Now, one thing that we quickly learned was this constant film versus tape battle back in the early 70s and mid 70s. Now, if you worked in television back then in the uh, world of uh, production end of television, uh, it, it, it became instantly obvious that there was this back and forth thing. Now, my feelings were that video is video and film is film, and that's kind of the way I thought of things. But having worked with advertising agencies, it was a whole different experience. Because remember, advertising agencies really wanted to shoot motion picture film. They didn't really care about video. Video became the second choice. If you were an ad agency person, a writer, an art director or something, you wanted to shoot a commercial in 35 millimeter and have that be the, your project. But video came into the picture because either the budgets were lower or because 
the uh, time frame. You had to deliver the commercial maybe the next week or maybe in just a couple days. So that became uh, video. But uh, we had to start to make things look like um, we had to try to do things that made it look a little more like film. And um, we did some early attempts because ad agencies insisted on it. Uh, they were reading Ad Age magazine. If you worked in an ad agency, Ad Age was the Bible back then, Advertising Age magazine. Uh, filmmakers had American cinematographer and video people. I think videography existed back then. But uh, all these magazines had these articles that said, when will video finally replace film? And another one might be, what to do on your next uh, video sh commercial shoot to make it look more like film? And so we had to uh, address that at TPC, or at least the commercial people did. And um, we tried to do some early attempts to make things look filmic or make it look more like video, or at least make the ad agencies think it looked more like video. And I got a couple examples of these. The first one that I know of was the, fo the fog filter and diffusion filter. And believe it or not, for what that looks like now, that was a, a pretty realistically common look if you uh, worked in television back then. They uh, used to crush the black level some, but that hazy look, which I kind of always thought looked like a camera with cataract vision or something, but uh, that was a common thing. And, and the next thing was women's sheer black pantyhose. And this was always fun because I had to go in the store either into a, uh, you know, into a department store or something to pick up these things. And it was always awkward. But you always bought queen size because you got the most material on the queen size and they were the same prices for the, the skinny girls. So anyway, you would take this stuff, cut apart the uh, part of the leggings and stretch it onto a filter frame. And this produced this look. And um, I can remember being in an ad agency, specifically Marsteller Advertising, and having the ad agency guys, uh, the art director, specifically look over at me. Now, here I am, the 23 and a half year old junior director. And he says, now, Glenn, what can we do to make, to get rid of some of the harshness of video and to, to make it look more like film? And what, what, what can you put on the lenses and things? And I, the standard answer was, we, well, we have a whole selection of things and we'll, we'll try different things and we'll all see it on the uh, monitor and we can uh, decide what looks best. So anyway, that was the standard answer. But anyway, these pantyhose things were, were very, very popular. Then, in 1973, an interesting thing happened because we got a job uh, that I was gonna direct from an ad agency that's right outside of Detroit. The ad agency was in Southfield, Michigan. The ad agency is still there, by the way. And um, our sales rep told the agency that to create a really good look, we would be using film lenses on the shoot. Well, as you may or may not know, a film lens doesn't just fit on a television camera. And uh, so anyway, there was a guy that we rented from him a film lens adapter. It was the first time I'd ever seen anything like this. Now this is a piece of PVC pipe, so, but this is 14 inches long and that's how long this, uh, this particular thing was. And um, the, on one end of the thing, it had the female for a standard Nikon lens. Any Nikon F series lens would fit on the one end of it. And then the other end, he had it modified to work on the Bosch television camera and TPC had a had a handheld camera called a Bosch Fernsey KCR 40 and that was a three plumicon camera that had one inch plumicons and um, anyway we rented this thing from this guy took it back to Pittsburgh we were up there for a casting session and uh, we literally went over and picked it up and then headed back to Pittsburgh on the Allegheny Airlines back then of course and the following day I brought it in and handed the adapter and several lenses that I had had at home, Nikon lenses, and to, to a guy named Ron Stutzman. Now, Ron, unfortunately, has passed away, uh, but Ron at the time was the senior video person at TPC, and he was in charge of cameras and camera alignment and all that stuff. And I said, here's the thing we were talking about that we want to use for tomorrow's um, project. 
And uh, so he looked at it and, of course, uh, acted sort of displeased with it. And uh, he said, okay, all right, I'll talk to you. Anyway, so I went up to my office and, uh, oh, maybe five, no, not five, maybe 15 minutes later, I get a call of the page, Glenn, come on down to the studio. So I go down there and there's the uh, Bosch camera on a tripod and it's pointed at a standard grayscale chart that you're familiar with and it's on a monitor. And I said, oh, wow, Ron, you already got it working. And he said, well, look carefully at it. And I said, well, uh, anyway, the picture was upside down. So the picture came out of it, flipped upside down. So suddenly we were faced with the fact we had to shoot with this the next day. And, uh, and I, the first thing I thought of is can, can the cameraman actually hold the camera upside down or what? Anyway, that became ridiculous. He said, let me work on it. Go away. Let me work on it. So, and he did work on it. He uh, uh, took the various uh, the deflection coils for the uh, red, green, and blue channels and swapped the polarity of them so that it literally scanned the uh, plumicons backwards. So he got the thing working. And the next day, we... Um, we went and uh, went and did this shoot. I had a pretty detailed shot list, and the camera was extremely awkward because it ended up being almost three feet long from the end of the lens to the back of the camera. But we made it through the day, and the clients, you know, were they seemed to be okay with it. And afterward, at TPC, what we would always do is we'd come back from a shoot, and then we'd hand the tapes to the editing guys, and we would take the client to dinner so that they could get the edit set up for the edit and we'd come back from dinner and then edit if we had to till midnight but uh, we finished the spot and it was the first time that I had ever seen a client really really happy because he thought what we were doing looked more like film I mean it was uh, it was an interesting reaction and anyway I was able to find a two inch copy of that original spot from 1973 and I sent it to a friend of mine in Nashville who converted it quickly to a file for me so I wanted to play that for you now now this is from 1973 and as I said it was photographed on the uh, Bosch uh, KCR 40 uh, television Plumicon TV camera with the uh, film lens adapter don't misplace your special credit union mailing about new family group life too the new life insurance plan that can give you up to twenty thousand dollars protection cover you for life insure your spouse and cover your kids to age 23 all for a dollar a week watch your mail it's important or stop in at your credit union your friend for life so anyway, that was the uh, original commercial from back then. And it made me totally realize that if given any kind of a choice, ad agency people, the creative people at ad agencies always would prefer to shoot on like 35 millimeter movie film rather than a standard interlace, standard def TV camera. And that became, you know, just planted in my head at the time. And, but at the same time, from having worked at TPC for two years, without question, videotape was the best way to do post-production for film-originated TV commercials. And clients did not mind. As a matter of fact, they liked videotape editing because they got to see stuff right away and they got to input changes if there was a change. So, so that became a... Um, Oh, what would you call it? An accepted thing to, to shoot film and finish on tape. Anyway, 46 years ago, Paul Hartwick and I decided to leave TPC and start our own company called Hartwick Przeborski Productions. And the entire reason for that company and the entire goal for what it was would be to shoot 35 millimeter film primarily. Also, we did a lot of 16 stuff, but to just shoot TV commercials. So I didn't care about any corporate videos or any of that stuff, just TV spots and then be able to uh, turn the spots around quickly and take advantage of the videotape for post-production. And here's why. All of our competitors back then were traditional filmmakers in the world of TV commercials. And I was so surprised to learn um, 
so many different things. I became friends with John Pitka, and John Pitka and his brother Joe Pitka were big time TV commercial guys. They introduced Bud Light, they were the Budweiser Clydesdales, uh, Gallo Wines, all these, you know, major clients. So anyway, they were out of Pittsburgh, and frequently we would bid against them, and frequently they would win the bid. But um, I asked him, how did you do post-production when it was on film? How, did, how could you do that? And he explained to me the whole process. And anyway, what they were stuck with um, was that when they did a job, it traditionally took three to four weeks from the time the shoot was finished till the time the final product was delivered to the ad agency ready for duplication, typically on two-inch tape at that point. So that, <laughs> that was uh, today, imagine today if you, had, if you were going to tell a client it's going to be three and a half weeks from the time we finish the shoot to the time you could air your TV ad. They would tell you to take a hike. Anyway, Paul Hartwick and I, we pioneered this way of doing things where we could turn around a 35 millimeter commercial in literally five days. And five days, uh, five working days from the time the shoot was over till the time the tape ready for someone to, um, to duplicate for TV stations. And so, you know, that became a uh, quite a, a successful thing. We were shooting uh, tons of uh, commercials. I like to think that people were using us because they thought we were so creative or whatever. But in reality, well, quite a few of the jobs we got were we were the only ones that could turn the job around that fast and originate the job on movie film. And uh, so anyway, that's, you know, that's how things worked out there with us. As a matter of fact, it was so unique, the process we were doing, and it, today it seems like Mr. Obvious, but back then it was so unique to solely focus shooting film for total tape production that back in the late 70s, I think this was 1979, Kodak did this big three-page spread on us on their national magazine on how you could turn around um, how you could turn around uh, a project as quickly as we did. And of course they did it because they wanted other people to start using this uh, process and of course buying movie film from Kodak. And uh, anyway, that's what happened there. Now, uh, Paul and Hartwick and I split up and, and left uh, each other back in 1987. But in 1989, and this is where the beginnings of this actual 24P's invention happens. Uh, I d developed a uh, relationship with a new partner, uh, Jim DeVincentis, and Jim is uh, a quite talented producer and he's been around the world a few times. And um, anyway, we picked up right where we left off. Of course, the equipment was newer and uh, the uh, transfer stuff was all to one inch at that time and um, also uh, with the newer ranks and tells we were using the turbo ranks and tells and the Bosch FDL 60s and all that type of equipment but uh, when we started to analyze particular jobs we realized a couple things and number one the most expense the biggest expense we were doing was 35 millimeter movie film followed by the processing and the setup for transfer, and then the $350 an hour film to tape transfers, and then of course all the FedEx shipping for overnight cost. And then of course when you did a shoot and you did the transfer, you had to be there because the colorist had no idea that certain colors were important or whatever. So it meant flying to the film transfer and hopefully being able to fly out that same night if the flight didn't get canceled or anything. So it made me think to myself, you know, there's got to be a better way of doing this. Now, as I said, I always followed the electronics world in addition to the uh, television world and by or the cinematography type world and by this time in 1989 as most of you might know the Plumicon tubes and the Viticons and the Satacons were all gone every television camera now had CCD imagers in there for the red green and blue channels and so solid state replaced tubes and they were so much better but they were still an interlaced signal and everything like that. And I thought to myself, well, we've got to have some technology now to, to simulate 
a movie film, and since we're, I'm only looking to simulate a movie film that has been transferred to tape. I'm not even looking at it to uh, to do something that's going to be, you know, into a uh, theater or something. And this became the start of 24P. And in 1989, I realized that something could be done here, and I didn't know exactly what it would be, but um, I got myself involved with a couple guys who were CMU graduates. And these guys were techno computer wizard type people. And I tried to explain to them what I was trying to do. And they thought it was interesting, but they didn't realize there was that much difference between film and video. And I find, later found out that neither of them watched TV. So, so that's the reason they didn't think of that. So uh, anyway, I got to them involved and I said, you know, what we should do is do a project that uh, we'll put together that will, will actually quantize what the difference is between film and videotape. And so we did some early experiments. And what I did was I mounted a television camera, uh, a broadcast quality CCD TV camera, right next to a 35 millimeter film camera. And what we did was we put the two side by side. I made sure the lens heights were pretty much exactly the same. And we thought, we'll shoot a dramatic situation a uh, improv thing. That's Debbie Doherty there, the woman. He, uh, she used to be my assistant, uh, assistant director, but uh, she now has a uh, company that reps talent. And uh, one of our crew guys, uh, Scott, played the uh, guy against her. And we shot a, a complete little three-minute dramatic thing uh, where everything was shot at exactly the same time on a videotape camera at the same time in the same instance it was being shot on motion picture film and what i did was i said let's do this in black and white for a bunch of reasons because color is so subjective it's so subjective you could have two identical videos or whatever one colored differently than the other and the audience will totally tell you that this thing works so much better in video or, or so much better on the first one rather than the second one at all. So I said, let's do black and white so we can just look at the image quality and the image itself. And I took the television camera and we ran it into what used to be called green tie, but let's just say luminescence channel only was feeding the signal. And of course we were adding you know, the burst to it so it could be recorded on one inch. And the 35 millimeter movie camera had standard color film and we tried to frame or I tried to frame every shot exactly the same so that the size proportions were the same, uh, ex basic exposure was the same. Because back in the early days, people would always say, well, the lighting on film is so much better than the lighting on video. And that's one of the reasons that film looks so much better. Well, we wanted the identical lighting. So these were all shot at exactly the same time, exactly the same uh, uh, point in time. So. Anyway, we shot a three minute sequence and then we went to TPC after the film was processed and that's, uh, that's Marty Scoff there who unfortunately has passed away also. Uh, Marty was in charge of their, uh, they had a rank Centel room and they converted uh, movie film to videotape. And I told Marty, I said, Marty, when you're doing this, make, pretend you're doing a movie in black and white yeah, whatever anyone in the room says, don't worry about it. Set up the uh, contours and the contrast and the uh, gamma and everything, just like you would on a nice, good-looking 35-millimeter movie film. And he did that. He did a really good job for us. And uh, anyway, we ended up with two identical uh, versions of that same exact shoot. I kept the same soundtrack on both of them so that the sound wouldn't be something that fooled you from one to the other. And uh, we started thinking about what the differences were between uh, film and, uh, and tape. And I, th I thought to myself, uh, there's two real differences, and we all agreed on this. And when, what I call the temporal cadence of film. When, f when film is shot, you know, everyone knows if camera has a shutter and all this other stuff and runs at 24 frames. But what you don't think sometimes is the fact that when a camera is shooting a scene, then the shutter shuts. Well, while that shutter is shut and the film is advancing, action and life is going on at the same time. So if a person's walking, you may have shut off the picture, but he's still walking, he's still moving. So things are happening and uh, a normal movie camera has what's called a 180 degree shutter. 
And that means if you're shooting at 24 frames per second, you're going to take a 48th of a second exposure, then a 48th of a second is going to be blanked out, and then there's going to be another 48th, another blank, another 48th. So it's like literally individual still photos with the same time frame between them that you had as, as the image, if you can follow along with that. And that's totally different than the way a video camera works, which a uh, normal NTSC back then, the standard def camera running interlaced, of course you're doing 60 fields per second, and a field is nothing more than a half resolution frame for all practical purposes. So there was literally no time between the frames, and that would create a smooth feeling when you pan left and right as opposed to the individual frame look. And uh, anyway, that, in my opinion, was the main difference between between film origination and video origination of the same type of, of product. Now, of course, there was a difference in the depth of field because, of course, the 35 millimeter camera was shooting a 24 millimeter wide image, and uh, the video tape camera that we were using was using two thirds inch CCDs, which are actually smaller than two thirds of an inch. And uh, so it, that camera had a much wider depth of field than the tighter depth of field that the uh, movie camera had. But um, anyway, I, uh, a lot of people are, were telling me at the time, well, the gamma setting of the gamma curve on film is so much different. Well, you could simulate that same gamma curve on a broadcast TV camera if you wanted, and you'd get a nice, good-looking, dramatic image. But uh, that wasn't the giveaway that it was film. To me, it was the temporal cadence of that, um, of that film. And so the next thing we did was we got together and I said, let's establish two simple goals. Now, one thing to remember, I had absolutely no interest in, or any, any concept that we would build a television camera and attempt to sell a camera or, or do, you know, like go on the market with a TV camera or anything. We were just looking at creating a, what I would call a technology demonstrator. A camera that uh, that people in the world of making TV cameras could say, uh, "Oh, I can see what you're talking about here," and that's what we were trying to do. So we established two goals. First, I wanted to emulate the look and feel of motion picture film that had been transferred to video, and that transferred to video is is key. All I cared about was standard definition. I didn't care about high def. Now, high def was being talked about. I think there was this thing called the Muse system, M-U-S-E, and, uh, and uh, NHK was doing some things and all. But not a single soul in the United States that I knew of had a high definition TV at home. And uh, all I cared about was standard definition and making something that would work. And um, we also, or I also insisted that it be compatible with NTST TV standards and it had to be able to be recorded on a standard recorder of any sort, one inch or whatever you wanted to use, and it had to be able to run through a switcher or a, a routing switcher or a, or a switcher. In other words, I didn't want to create a unique format, which you know people have tried in the past, and, uh, and that's a really difficult thing. You've got to be as big as a Sony or something like that to do anything like that. So anyway, that's the way we started out. And, um, the next thing that happened, and since, as I, as I mentioned, I, I follow along with the, uh, with the world of what's out there and what isn't for electronics, um, we found that there was a company making an industrial camera. Now, industrial cameras are those ones you see typically on a microscope in a lab. They're about six inches long, they're about two and a half inches wide and about an inch high, and they always usually have a C-mount lens uh, holder on the front. And there was a company out in uh, California, I believe it was, that in the back of a magazine was talking about they were doing a progressive scan. Of course, it was standard definition, but they were doing two progressive scans at a time. They were doing, they were shooting 60, um, I'm sorry, 60 progressive frames per second. So 60 full progressive frames per second instead of the normal 30, you know, for NTSC. And I'm rounding off the numbers. I'd be, obviously, it's 2997 and 5994. But anyway, theirs could do 60 progressive frames. So I thought to myself, well, this is a great opportunity here because what if we take that 60 frames per second 
and we throw away every other frame. So we take frame one, throw away frame two, pick up frame three, throw away frame four. And I explained this to the guys that we had working with us. And they were able to buy, I guess it was a, uh, I guess they're called frame capture cards or something, it goes in a computer. And they were able to have the software to do this, where you picked frame one, held it for the 30th, or for the frame, picked uh, frame three, and, and basically skip one frame at a time. And uh, this worked unusually well. And now, of course, for those of you who are electronics people and, and people are thinking, wait a minute, that's not 24p, that would be 30p. And that's true. Our first test and our first experiment was a 30 frame, 30p progressive camera system. And of course, it was black and white. And of course, it was standard, def excuse me, standard definition. And uh, we put this thing together, and uh, I was pretty impressed with what it looked like. It, uh, I found some things when watching the image that we were putting out that um, the grain structure, the noise structure on a uh, progressive imager running the way we were running it looked very much like the grain of motion picture film. As a matter of fact, it looked very much like Tri-X film. Uh, if you're familiar with still photography, the Tri-X is a standard 35mm um, uh, from the old days still camera uh, film. Anyway, we took that uh, Tri-X or that uh, footage and we recorded several different people. We had a couple actors uh, do a, I had one woman lean against a window in our offices and she did a, a little dramatic uh, impromptu thing about her, her life and stuff, talking about it. And we thought, you know, this looks it isn't exactly like 24p film, but it looks pretty much like something. It doesn't does not look like you know standard interlaced video. And uh, anyway, that's kind of as far as it would have gone. Uh, you know, we were we were impressed by it and thought it was okay. And uh, anyway, at the time, you had to remember, I'm directing and filming TV ads all around the country. And these other two guys are working at a computer company. And uh, so we're not doing this, you know, every day, we're doing this every once in a while, when we get together talking about it. And these guys are working on different parts of the electronics on their own at home. And uh, anyway, this went on for a while. And then all of a sudden, we get I get a call from a guy named Chris Labash, and Chris Labash is the, he's the creative director at Ketchum Advertising at the time. And I know you guys are not into the world of advertising, but Ketchum was the biggest ad agency in all of Pennsylvania. They happened to be in Pittsburgh, but back then they were handling 3M. They were handling digital equipment company. They were handling the accounts for nationwide insurance and just tons of accounts. They were a big time agency, the biggest in Pennsylvania. Well, when Chris Labash calls you and wants to talk about a project, you certainly jump on with him. And uh, he stopped by our office, which was only a few blocks away from where Ketchum was in Gateway 4. And uh, he's talking to me about the fact that he wants to do a thrift drug campaign for uh, J.C. Penney's had a division called Thrift Drug back then. They were throughout the mid-Atlantic uh, states. And uh, he said, but I want to do it in black and white. I want to do these testimonials in black and white. And I don't... Um, I didn't know if you had to use actual black and white film or whether when color film is stripped of its color, does it still look like real black and white? So I played him one of these tapes that we did on one inch tape with these people. And as I'm playing it, he goes, well, what type of film is that? And I said, well, it isn't really film. It's this project we've been working on for a while. Uh, and uh, he said, well, can we use that? Because that'll save us from having to constantly change roles of film every 10 minutes. And so anyway, to make a long story short and to cut to the chase on that, we ended up doing six big time regional ads for thrift drugs. They were edited over at Delia Witkowski's uh, post-production place. And um, they all were shot with this small modified camera and the frame grabber and a uh, time-based corrector after that so that uh, they could be recorded onto one inch. And um, so anyway, that was uh, an interesting experience of how 30p was acceptable to people as film and no one ever thought that they weren't film. And uh, so anyway, that's what happened there. Now, 1993, our little team of people had eventually put together a complete 
actually running a 24 frame per second uh, system. And that system, of course, added 3-2 pull down so that that system could um, that system could actually be recorded on a standard uh, tape machine. Uh, remember, back then, uh, it wasn't common at all to record onto uh, hard drives or anything. I mean, I'm sure that technology existed, but in, in not in the real world. The uh, people were still using tape back then. So we built this thing, and it actually did 24p, and it actually looked pretty damn good. But, of course, it was black and white. And as I said earlier, this was to be a technology demonstrator. And what I wanted to do was take this thing and the video from it and try to go to camera companies and sell them on the idea that, you know, this would be a great product. It'd be the holy grail of, uh, of production. If we can, if you guys could make a camera that did what this one did only in full color and all the other stuff. So anyway, that's where things sat. And, uh, we, uh, we decided to apply for a patent on it, which uh, we did back in, uh, uh, let's see, uh, the patent we did was filed in 1994 on the idea of creating this 24 frame thing. And in 1995, the patent office, uh, United States Patent Office entered, uh, issued us patent 5475425. And if you guys go to the United States Patent Office, uh, you can actually look up that patent and see all the, the details and the block diagrams of how this, uh, this camera actually worked, the final version of it. We never actually used that because, quite frankly, uh, no, no one wants to shoot a TV commercial in black and white. And uh, so we always hoped that something would come along, but nothing ever did. But uh, that, was the, that formed the block diagram of, of how that was done. And uh, anyway, to carry on from where we just left off there, um, on the 24P timeline, in the year 2000, which was, well, six years after that, and by the way, we were having pretty much, we were having no success getting any of the electronics companies interested in the idea of doing a 24P uh, television camera or a camera that could do that function. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can't, relate to you the, the guy's name because uh, it wouldn't be fair to him. But we got a very nice letter back from a major electronics company explaining that there's no reason that they could see that they would want the image and the purity of the, of, of the way they were doing a camera now with interlacing and all. They wouldn't want the purity of that to look steppy like we were showing on our test videos. And so, um, Anyway, it, it was a hard sell, let's put it that way. And as I said, at the same time, I'm working on other jobs and all, so it wasn't like I was spending the rest of my life trying to do this thing. And in 2000, uh, right before uh, Larry Thorpe made this announcement, uh, Sony uh, made an arrangements with our people and licensed the patents from us that we had. Uh, and it was a one-time license fee, and that was, that was that as far as Sony goes. And Larry Thorpe, who, in my humble opinion and somewhat educated opinion, is the smartest guy that has ever worked in the world, world of electronics and television. Uh, when you think of all that he did at RCA and then at Sony, and anytime you see that Cine Alta logo, it's something to do with what Larry originated over there at that company. Uh, you know, he's an amazing man. And uh, the camera that he came out with, of course, was the F900. And that was three CCDs, full high definition. It had progressive scan, and it was a uh, for, uh, HD cam format camcorder. And uh, that camcorder was unique because when you switched it into 24 frame mode, the tape deck system actually slowed down. So you got 30 minutes if you were recording at 29.97, but if you switched it to 24 frame or 23.976, the, can't, the entire mechanism, head wheel and everything else slowed down to make up for it. So suddenly you had a 40 minute tape instead of a 30 minute tape, which was great. So um, anyway, the F900 was a, uh, was a big, big deal back then. And uh, if you remember, the F900 or the Panavise version where they put a Panavision lens mount on the, on the front of it was what shot the movie Star Wars Episode Two. Attack of the Clones, and uh, this was a really big deal. And Larry Thorpe's um, 
Larry Thorpe's vision was far, far bigger than mine. Uh, Larry Thorpe wanted to replace film in general, including in the movie theater and all. And uh, ours was just a uh, to be standard definition and to be something to replace film that was on television. But he, you know, he had a bigger, uh, bigger outlook and a bigger thing than anything we did. And in 2002, um, Panasonic introduced the DVX100. And this was an amazing little camera. They had, they had licensed our patents also, uh, Panasonic did. And this little camera was, was only about this big. And, but it had a built-in 10 to 1 lens. It had a, uh, a neat little section here where you could switch between uh, normal shooting, you know, like normal 2997, or you could shoot at 24 frame progressive. And then it added the 3 2 pull down, like our original patent showed. And then it recorded on a standard mini DV cassette. And that recording was compatible with any mini DV player that existed at the time. And uh, it was quite a thing. And it was also, it was also the first affordable. 24p uh, camcorder. It um, it was, I believe, the uh, selling price originally on that thing was uh, thirty five hundred dollars, if I remember. And it became super popular with wedding photographers. It became popular with TV stations that had a a documentary unit within the station where they went out and do you know investigative journalism and things. And it was became very very popular with independent guys that were doing uh, corporate videos and all. As a matter of fact, they introduced three separate, I believe it was three separate um, improvements on it: the DVX uh, B and the C, or I think it was, or the A, B, and C, or something. But anyway, it literally was a was a was a big deal back then because of its cost. And uh, we decided that it was time for ad agencies to hear about. Uh, this 24 frame thing. And this, this sounds so crazy, but in the advertising world back in 2002, they still thought of film is here and videotape is here. Now, we were making a decent amount of money on the film part of it, so uh, this was kind of anti-productive to us. But we wanted to show clients that there was an option where they could shoot at a relative expense of normal video, but produce the same look of movie film. And so uh, I thought, well, it's time for the ad agency people to know about this. So we produced, using that little DVX100, we produced a standard definition video that was a couple minutes, three minutes long, and sent it to every ad agency that we knew. And we had about four or 500 ad agencies on our, our list, on our um, mailing list and all. And we wanted them to see this new technology and to think of it if they wanted to do something, you know, that was higher quality than just a normal, you know, video ad, that this could actually suffice for film. And of course, we wanted them to think of us if, uh, <laughs> if they decided they had to do that. So anyway, I thought I'd show you guys the, um, what the ad agency people saw when we sent this thing out. And this was frequently, uh, from what we were told, the first time anybody at the ad agency world ever even heard of something called 24P and uh, the capabilities it had. Now we shot this, as I said, on the DVX100. Now you're watching scenes that were shot on a 24p digital camera that was designed to emulate the look of motion picture film. Although I've directed and photographed literally hundreds of television commercials shooting them in 35mm, the one thing that all the spots had in common was that they were all posted in video and of course distributed on video. In the late 80s, I began to ask if it would be possible to design a TV camera whose sole purpose was to emulate the look and feel of motion picture film that had been transferred to video. As part of our original research, I shot some test scenarios with a 35mm motion picture camera mounted on the same platform as a conventional broadcast TV camera. Uh, we are, oh, <laughs> what do you mean? Casting agent Debbie Doherty volunteered to play a dramatic role in one of these tests. We then edited the material and analyzed the technical as well as the esoteric differences between the film and the conventional video. Our team started to work on a progressive scan camera system that would effectively shoot at 24 frames per second 
yet the output video signal was to be compatible with normal American TV standards. In the early 90s, we applied for worldwide patents on this technology. The driving force behind our efforts was economics. As an executive producer of TV commercials, it's obvious to me that the preferred medium of origination is 35mm film. But sometimes, the only drawback is cost. This 1,000-foot roll of 35mm Eastman color negative costs $611, and it runs through the camera in just 11 minutes, and it costs $280 to process leader and clean it, then between $400 and $700 per hour to transfer it to DigiBeta. And that doesn't take into account overnight shipping, sync-ups, and other expenses. Now, when you consider that the average 30-second commercial uses about 7,000 feet of film, the cost to buy the film, process it, and transfer it can quickly jump to tens of thousands of dollars. The thought of producing 35 millimeter quality spots without the expense of film is what fostered our investment in what the industry now calls 24P. These circuit boards here are from our original prototype camera. The first time we really put it to use was in 1991. I talked to my pharmacist at Thrift. What he does is he takes time. He listens to me. Oh, okay, that may sound like a small thing to you, but... At that time, I directed a multi-spot, black and white, thrift drug campaign for Ketchum Advertising. Everyone thought the commercials were shot on film. In 1995 and 1998, the U.S. Patent Office issued these two patents for our efforts. For licensing purposes, a few years ago, we packaged our patents with those of Burbank, California's Film Look Incorporated. 24P is not the magic bullet. It won't save a bad concept, and you still need good lighting and creative direction. Does 24P digital video look exactly like film? No, but 95% of the audience won't notice any difference. It's the ideal origination medium for time-sensitive or budget-conscious projects. Thanks for your interest in Przeborski Productions. We look forward to the opportunity of working with you on either your film or your 24P projects. Anyway, that's uh, that was the first time that uh, quite a few ad agencies ever got the uh, got to hear or or to even think about uh, this new technology called 24P. And uh, anyway, to, to wrap up, I just wanted to go through a quick uh, timeline of how things happened after that point. And uh, to start with, Dalsa, who you may not know that name, but Dalsa is a company from Canada that makes very high-end imaging, uh, CCDs and CMOS devices. As a matter of fact, they make some of the imagers that are in the Mars rover, from what I understand. And so uh, to even be in that category, you've got to be pretty damn good. But they introduced a camera called the Dalsa Origin. It was a pretty good-sized camera. And it was the first camera back in 2003 that had a 35-millimeter-sized imager and uh, it shot 4K video. Now, they only made two of those cameras totally, uh, two of them, and they never sold them. They only rented them, and they were used in, from what I understand, uh, four or five different commercial campaigns, as well as uh, certain scenes in certain movies where uh, it was kind of a unique thing that uh, replaced film at the time they were being used. Then in 2007, everyone's familiar with RED Digital, Red shipped their first Red One digital camera, and also, and it had the CMOS, uh, which is complementary metal oxide semiconductor, the CMOS 35 millimeter sized imager, and um, that uh, that I I believe every camera that I know of from now on is, has a CMOS imager. So uh, that ca camera had to be uh, you know <laughs> a pretty big landmark. I, I, w I used that camera on a number of shoots and the very first one they came out with wasn't reliable. The current red ones are very reliable and uh, and are very, very good. The first ones were just a new camera with a new company and it was, uh, you had to constantly um, update the firmware and all. But the new ones are, are, are pretty damn good. And in 2008, the amazing Canon 5D Mark II came out, and this was the, uh, as I wrote here, the first DSLR that could shoot 24-frame video using a full-frame 36 by 24 millimeter CMOS imager. And this camera changed everything, and today any uh, still camera that you buy can shoot 24p, and it was all because of the success of that 5D Mark II. Uh, they all shoot video. You could. It was the first time a digital camera. You just flip a switch, and it became a video camera. And uh, 
you know, it was quite a uh, an amazing thing for them to uh, to put that thing together and to put it out on the market. I think it sold for about five thousand uh, dollars. Of course, I was one of the first in line to buy it and to see what it was like, and uh, it was uh, quite a camera. It had more a pattern problem and it had uh, aliasing problems, but for a first generation thing, it was it was uh, it changed the industry uh, in still photography. That's for sure. Then in 2010, a big deal happened. Aeroflex introduced the Alexa, and I'm not talking about the <laughs> the Alexa that uh, Amazon has. This was uh, their standard movie camera or standard uh, digital camera, and it had the industry standard Aeroflex PL, which stands for positive lock, the standard PL mount, and uh, that camera had a 52 millimeter flange distance, which was the same as all Aeroflex movie cameras. It uh, it had literally any lens that a cinematographer had that would fit on an Aeroflex 35 millimeter movie camera would fit on the Alexa. And it would produce about the same size image. And suddenly all these, the big end cinematographers that were always, it was beneath them to shoot video of any sort. It was like, oh, well, we're film guys. We're not the video guys. There's some video guys over there. Well, as soon as the Alexa came out from their favorite company, Airy, Aeroflex, and by the way, it's pronounced Aeroflex and Airy. It's not pronounced Ari as all these YouTubers say. But uh, when Aeroflex came out with that camera, they suddenly had to say, well, maybe I should look into this. And uh, you'll find that in the Academy Awards this year, probably 60 or 70 percent of the films will have been shot with a, an Airy uh, Alexa and uh, their current version of it. And in 2011, it was kind of... Um, the the bar stool being kicked out from the film guys because Panavision, Aeroflex, and Aton all announced that they would no longer be making any more film cameras, and uh, that kind of like sends a uh, shockwave of a message throughout the entire industry to say something like that. And then following the next year, Fuji in 2012 announced that they are ending all motion picture film manufacturing. And of course, if you don't have film, you're not going to be able to shoot film. Now, to let you folks understand, because probably none of you have ever bought movie film before, or maybe one or two of you, um, it used to be Kodak and Fuji were the two that supplied camera film. Uh, they were both very, Kodak was probably king of the hill, certainly, and but Fuji was unique in that you could get a deal with Fuji. So if you were shooting something, um, Fuji had a uh, film stock called Eterna, and it was super popular for sitcoms and, or things like uh, the show Friends and different things where they were shooting on film, using a lot of film. Well, Fuji would give you a deal. And if you were doing something, you could call the rep and you might get, uh, on a particular week, you might pay for eight rolls and get 10 1,000 foot rolls, depending how their stock was flowing. And you could always get something off on Fuji, uh, usually, unless you were just buying one or two rolls. Kodak never gave a discount. They never gave a discount to anybody. As a matter of fact, the Kodak rep would tell you, you know, Glenn, you're paying the same for your film as Steven Spielberg would pay for his film. I said, well, that's fine. He's a multimillionaire and I'm not, you know, so uh, <laughs> what kind of plus thing is that? He said, no, they don't get deals out in Hollywood. They pay the same price. Well, you know, well, well whatever. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, that's um, uh, once uh, once Fuji stopped making film. And the other reason Fuji stopped making film and most prints that you were watching in movie theaters was actually printed on Fuji film because it was a less expensive way for laboratories to buy movie films for these massive runs. Like for example, the movie Titanic was, uh, uh, they would go through tons of film. Well, if they were using Fuji film, it looked the same as Kodak film and for all practical purposes in the movie theater, but it was cheaper. It processed exactly the same. And once the digital cinema thing took over and digital projectors replaced real projectors, suddenly, you know, what is Fuji going to be making this film for? They don't, uh, they don't need to make the film anymore. And to pretty much wrap things up here, uh, if you look at where 24P digital imaging versus film is today, 24P is included in virtually every camera made that shoots video. And uh, that's, that's pretty much a 
fair statement. I, uh, all the current ones that I've ever seen have that function ability in it. And the latest CMOS imagers exceed film's dynamic range. Uh, the if you were to shoot a film today, you would buy, if you wanted to shoot it on film, you would buy Kodak's 5219. That's the standard emulsion that's the, any movie made is, that shot as movie film is shot on 5219. And uh, that is considered to have 14 and a half f-stops of, of uh, that means the, where you could see detail in the darkest area and detail in the brightest area of the scene. 14 and a half f-stops, which is pretty damn good. But the latest imagers, for example, uh, Red has an imager now that does 17 f-stops from dark to light, and the latest Aeroflexes are advertised at 15, but they, people have said that they're actually doing more than 15 f-stops on those cameras. So anyway, the high-speed digital cameras now shoot higher frame rates than was ever possible on film cameras. Now I've shot a lot of slow motion, uh, especially in food photography over the years, and um, like falling vegetables and different things. And 360 frames per second was the fastest you could shoot 35 millimeter film and have it actually be pin registered each frame. Now of course there's cameras that shoot at god awful speeds, but they use what's called a rotary prism. In a rotary prism, the film never stops. This prism just bends the light around on the film as it comes. You don't get distinct frame lines and the one picture sort of blends into the next. It's more than adequate for studying the ballistics of a missile or something like that, but it's useless if you were shooting, you know, a scene for a movie where it was, you wanted true slow motion. So 360 was the limit on how fast 35 millimeter film could be transferred to a, a movie camera. Well, right now, in full high definition, which 1920 by 1080, there's cameras that are running up to four to 6,000 frames per second at that uh, resolution. And now there's cameras that are at 1,000 frames per second shooting full 4K at full resolution. So you can see that's, that, <laughs> that's a lot higher than film could ever do. And now the 6K and 8K digital cameras far exceed 35 millimeters resolution. Uh, the newest cameras, um, for example, Sony has a new camera out that it's been out for quite a while. It's called the Venice. And their latest iteration of it um, is, I believe, a 6K or an 8K imager, and it's higher resolution than film. And of course, the latest ARRI uh, LF, which is large format ARRI, is far higher resolution than movie film can do. And um, Anyway, so we're getting down to the point where what does film have going for it? And, but Kodak still makes motion picture film. And um, by the way, a, um, a current roll of 1,000 foot roll, which is about this big, of uh, Eastman Color Negative, that 5219 I was telling you, sells for $783 a roll. And it will cost you $200 to get it processed and that doesn't include, you know, transferring it to video or anything. So you got to basically a thousand dollars on motion picture film for every eleven minutes of film, and so you could see that's that's quite a decent amount of money. And uh, but film is still used. Uh, you know, people say, well, kind of, does anyone use film? Yes. For example, if you saw um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I believe it was a Quentin Tarantino movie, that was all shot on motion picture film and of course transferred to video and edited on, you know, digital. And the latest James Bond movie that's out in the theaters right now, that was shot on 35 millimeter film and of course post-produced digitally. And uh, anyway, so the two mediums still exist. Probably at the Academy Awards this year you'll see uh, quite a few uh, Quite a few TV, uh, quite a few uh, winners that are shot on the Alexa, maybe one or two on a red, and the rest will be shot on motion picture film. So, anyway, that's where things stand right now. And uh, I appreciate you guys, and I appreciate you asking me for uh, to talk about this. And I'm more than happy to answer questions. So, We have a, uh, a Q&A thing. Uh, no questions have been asked at this point. Um, <laughs> Glenn's got the finish up. Shouldn't that have scratch marks through it and um, pocket holes? 
Um, well, it could, it could maybe, but it was a, just a still frame. I saw, <laughs> I saw, uh, John. There's quite a few things that say chat with the name. With the, yes. there's a twenty six, whatever that means. I'm not familiar with this, but um, I'm looking here. Let's see. Well, absolutely remarkable talk. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, of uh, kudos for your presentation and you know i lived through that period glenn like you and uh, uh there were a lot of details in there that i didn't realize you know that yeah. uh, i hadn't really uh because i was more on the engineering side i really didn't and and certainly the video side so um i, yeah. I didn't know that um i can theoretically turn on anybody's microphone and allow them to talk to you um usually uh, participants attendees are are uh, muted so oh. i don't know i've if... got uh, i've got one john if well well other yeah, people are thinking of their questions if you if you want to submit a question use the q a button on your on your screen and uh hopefully we'll get a couple questions but uh, i'm gonna keep my camera off because it won't stop glitching uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh glenn it was fantastic uh, i really enjoyed yeah, you know, the presentation, and I also enjoyed your uh, your your photos. Recognized a lot of people from from back in the day. <laughs> yeah, in your, was, uh, in your yeah, photographs. It was, and the it was worst part a... is, almost all the friends that I knew are dead. I mean, yeah, <laughs> in the picture, I, know, I didn't realize that till I was putting it together. Yeah, we had, oh. there was quite a quite a community back in those days, and everybody worked with everybody else. It was really, it was pretty really pretty great. But uh, and I've, I've I've edited a lot of stuff you've shot, and uh, you know, and and worked on it. I, you know, one question question I had was I, I saw a mention of film look uh, in, in your presentation mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. film look has always been kind of a mystery to me. And I've, I've spent, I, I've sent countless, you know, finished spots and rolls of, of video footage out the film look, you know, back in, back years ago when I, when I did a lot of editing and, uh, uh, and it came back and, you know, we used it as it was. I didn't know, I didn't really feel whether it looked any different than what I sent out, but there definitely was a look and but i wondered what what was going on in that process it what, were they electronically trying to do what you were doing with your cameras well, well we got to be friends with them and um only because of the fact that when if you're going to license a patent the ideal thing that companies like is that they're making one deal and handling the entire area of, of that patent for example and film look had a couple patents that um that dealt with uh, different aspects of trying to create a film, you know, a film look, as well as a uh, television camera theoretical type patent. And uh, we decided to group ours with his. And uh, in that way, when, you know, Sony and different companies licensed this thing, uh, they signed off on one license and, um, and it literally covered every aspect of the, uh, of that subject matter. So that's how uh, we got involved with them. I don't know how his process worked. I know it was a videotape to videotape thing through a uh, electronic um, box that was custom made that they did. And uh, I know when I was out at his facility once uh, at Film Look, they were doing Disney shows that were uh, previous shows that were shot on uh, videotape that they were converting over to look like they were shot on film. So I guess he did quite a bit of business doing that. Yeah, they're still around, as far as I know. They, yeah. I get, uh, I get emails from them. I get they make a lot of plugins for, you know, for editing and uh, effect plugins and things. So it's mm -hmm. nice to see that they're still around. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thanks again. It was really great. All right, and uh, I see some questions, Glenn. I assume oh, okay. you can see them too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just clicked on that. All right, right here. It says, uh, "Was film stock versus the video sensor sens sens sensitivity an issue, especially as it impacted exposure and depth of field?" Um, not really. Uh, the uh, you know, film was always sold over the years as different ASAs or ISO, as it's called now. It used to be always ASA. American Standards Association instead of the uh, International Standards Organization. But uh, you could buy, you know, 100 ASA or you could buy the next step was 500. And uh, I think that 500 was the highest that uh, 35 millimeter film was, uh, color film. But um, I'm not sure that I've never bought anything higher than 500. But it says is versus uh, video sensor. No, it, what's happening now is that uh, every video sensor that you see. As a matter of fact, I have a 
one of my favorite cameras right now is this thing here, which is the, uh, this is a Fuji X-T4. And um, it, you know, they, almost all the cameras now have an 800 ISO as the standard ISO. And um, that's more than what you need unless you're doing, you know, police work at night or something <laughs> or trying to catch someone in a parking lot or something in the, at night. But uh, the, the, uh, the 800 ISO is to me an excellent uh, speed and I, I still shoot quite a few um, hospital ads. Uh, we work with, um, well, there's ads on right now in Pittsburgh for Excella Healthcare when I do all their ads and all. And uh, the 800 ISO I've shot in operating rooms where, you know, it's very low light and you just use faster lenses or switch it to 1600 ISO and that camera is, is pretty damn clean. But, uh, and uh, as far as the uh, uh, sensitivity, so anyway, it affects depth of field. Um, everyone that, uh, if they want super shallow depth of field, of course, you, um, you put a uh, neutral density filter on the lens and, and then open the lens up to a, uh, you know, as wide as it'll go, and that'll be the most shallow depth of field. But it says, Glenn, have you ever shot in 70 millimeter? No, but my dad has tons of shots in 35 and 70. And how do you know about current uses or advances there? I, they still make 70, 70 millimeter in the movie world is actually 65 millimeter film. And the reason it's 65 is that they, when it is made into a print, the edges become five millimeters wider to accommodate the magnetic soundtracks. So the camera actually runs 65 millimeter film and then the, uh, the outer edges on the print stock become the magnetic uh, things. Uh, that's the way they do, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, IMAX and all that other stuff. I've never had the opportunity to work on that. My dad has shot a, they would, 70 millimeter was a real common film uh, stock uh, out at uh, Cape Canaveral. There was, um, there was always um, 70 millimeter running and um, it's uh, it doesn't run as fast as you think because the frames now they were using f full frames they they didn't want uh, like what people are shooting 70 now um, I'm tr trying to remember the director that uh, oh he's he always shoots 70 millimeter um, uh, I, I'll think of his name in a second but uh, they only have two sprocket holes higher than the normal four sprocket hole pull down of 35. So even though the film is much wider, it's only running another, I think that would be another half again faster. So a thousand foot roll would become, I think seven minutes instead of um, 11 minutes, the way it is on uh, 35 millimeter. Uh, it said, have you ever shot? No. So the answer is no, I never did. I. Um, my dad was, it was funny during, uh, when he was uh, uh, working out there, um, they would encourage, it's hard to believe different things the way it would be. They would encourage him to take movie cameras home when new stuff came out and practice loading and unloading the cameras and stuff. I mean, that would be, you know, hey, Joe, take this uh, thing home and this is a brand new whatever, you know. And um, they did that because it was cheaper than, you know, they could, RCA could tell him to do that, but anyway, he would take it home, and I would, of course, play with it while it was home. So, so it, uh, uh, and we used to shoot. Um, you know, people saw maybe in the earlier part of the video where I was explaining how I used to shoot these 16 millimeter um, uh, little films that we did, these uh, three to five minute little films, and uh, my dad was able to get that stuff processed at uh, the uh, Patrick Air Force Base lab, which handled all the uh, Air Force uh, film that was done at uh, Cape Canaveral, because the amount we were, sh we were doing was inconsequential. We would shoot, say, 400 feet. Well, th they could splice that at the end of a 120,000 foot run of movie film and not even know it was there. So anyway, I guess that's it, huh? Yeah, Glenn, I don't see any more questions, and you thoroughly covered it. Uh, I have to, I have to say, it was uh, very interesting, uh, mostly because it was a combination of engineering and creativity that uh, made it happen. 
uh, most people just take 24p for granted ah uh, you know just the, i guess the camera manufacturer made it you know so it was a real interesting look into the history of it oh. thanks very much oh sure welcome someone asked yeah catch that one <laughs> what what are you recording your zoom session on well i have here a uh a fuji xt3 camera and it has a 35 millimeter canon lens on the front of it so yeah i told glenn he was embarrassing me with my piece of crap logitech uh, webcam <laughs> but uh, oh. i couldn't do any better no it's uh, it's all you need to have really i just did this <laughs> because we we end up doing so many pre-pro meetings on on video uh, anymore you know because of yeah. covid and COVID has changed everything. It's really, um, it's really, uh, in, you know, quite frankly, hurt our business because so many clients uh, just can't, uh, and who knows what we're running into now with the new strain and all this other stuff and how things are coming. We've had numerous shoots that were either count, they eventually got canceled, but they started out being moved back because we have to, you know, if you remember, uh, t everything stopped at one point where you weren't allowed to do anything. And um, we had three huge projects at that time that uh, one of them came through at a later date, but the other one just disappeared. And a lot of uh, a lot of companies, uh, I, you know, I see things changing in the whole way. The whole industry is changing and uh, um, a lot of uh, companies are actually uh, recording or doing their own commercials now in internally. Um, I know of one that's a. Uh, uh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't mention their names on the camera here, but, but uh, you know, where it used to be a, you know, a good thing that we were doing every twice, at least twice a year. And uh, now it's being done internally by people and uh, for a tiny fraction of the cost. And um, you like to think that it would have been better if you did it, but, <laughs> but, but it's... Uh, you know, it's water over the dam and it, whatever it is, is probably working for them or they wouldn't keep doing it. So anyway. well, again, Glenn, thanks so much. Uh, you know, we pretty well run the entire time of the meeting with your presentation yeah. and that's great. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I see a lot of thanks here in the chat session. Oh. Very interesting. Oh. Yeah, um, oh. I just want to well, make a good. few. I, I'm, you know, hopefully somebody uh, hopefully people, you know, and I know a lot of the older guys that are part of Simpty uh, probably remember the uh, stockings on lenses and all kind of crap that we went yeah, through. I remember and, it at TPC, and, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, and that was a, uh, I thought we'd have a little bit of a fun talking about that because, you know, I don't, you know, in today's world of post-production with the sophisticated color correction ability. And uh, of course now it's called, called color grading because they've adopted the British terminology for it but uh at least uh you can if you have a decent camera of any sort you can make a really good looking picture out of it and uh as proof of that uh there are uh, there's a commercial running did you see the one now running for somebody that where they actually shot it on an iphone oh yeah yeah and yeah. um and the iphone has the you figure it has one of these has more capabilities than what we used to drag around with a camera that weighed 150 pounds and uh, so it's a but fun as time you said, Glenn, to be in. You can take that iPhone, but if you have bad lighting, a bad concept, a bad acting, uh, yeah. the, the whole thing goes down <laughs> yeah. the dumper. Yeah, um, for sure. And, and um, yeah, it doesn't matter if it's 24p. Now, you asked me before about uh, the um, now they're using, what is it, one camera during a football game that's, that's oh, a yeah. larger imager? camera yeah and, maybe uh, some of the other people who are listening in would be interested in that um you know sony is uh, uh providing a super 35 single imager camera that is being used for uh, typically for close-up shots with a short depth of field which is of course very difficult for the cameraman but it does uh move your eye to the object they want you to see because everything else is out of focus uh, mm -hmm. I think it's an experiment. I don't know if it'll work, uh, but uh, I'd be interested uh, 
if you have an opinion or anyone else on well, uh, where that's going. My opinion is to. it's a uh, they're trying to fix something that isn't broken once yeah, again. <laughs> I agree. Yes. And uh, yes. when you're yeah. watching a live, there's a certain look. You know, I understand from a guy who told me this, and I don't know if it's true. I've never been able to prove it, but on the um, on the 24p thing. I always imagined when we started that whole thing that this would be incorporated into big time cameras, but would never find its way into small consumer stuff because I didn't think anyone would ever want to do that in the uh, in the small world. They were there shooting their kid or their dog mm -hmm. running around or something. But as it turns out, that's not the case, obviously. And, uh, uh, you know, it's. Um, the same with this, with that imager thing, with the uh, with the uh, thing. When you watch a football game, there's a certain look that, like any piece cameras have, it's just a live, gorgeous look where you see everything, and and that's what you expect to see on your big TV. And whether or not the scene is, you know, where it's shallow depth of field, to me that doesn't add or subtract anything from the game or or what you're watching. As a matter of fact, it makes you think, what's different about that camera rather than all the other ones, you know. Or something like that but uh so but anyway i understand what i was trying to say here is that um i always kind of thought they could shoot uh soap operas in 24p and they would look like they were movies rather yeah, than sounds you know, reasonable to thing. me all right that's a thought that i had well i was told that they actually did that once or twice uh, because, you know, as George will tell you, the, the newer uh, Sony cameras, I believe, have that function where you can switch into the 24 frame mode on the broadcast cameras or, and, uh, and, and do stuff like that. Anyway, I was told that they did that. And when they did, the audience, the young, you know, the women and primarily that watch those soaps did not like that at all. They like to feel that it's a live thing that's happening as they watch it not something that's been done in the past, which film always looks like it's not real. It looks like it's something that's been done, you know, previously and being shown to you. They like the idea that, that a soap opera is an original thing that's happening live while they're watching it. Of course, they're not. They're on tape but uh, or on the digital file. But, but anyway, I was told that it was tried once or twice and it wasn't a successful attempt. Most so. of the Super Bowl halftime shows are shot in uh, 24p and of late have been shot with Ari Alexis. Oh, yeah. Uh, systemized to look different than the game. Yeah. Yeah. And that. that makes more sense, I think, than intercutting um, a, uh, a film look, for lack of a better term, in the middle of a, a sports game. Uh, it's a new, a new piece of equipment that needs to be played with. So. <laughs> and, and Sony is now providing Venice cameras, and there is actually a Sony large format single imager studio style camera now that. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, has the, all uh, the handles and stuff so that it can easily integrate. Into the Venice the is going to get a lot of play because the new, all the new, um, uh, what's it called, Avatar movie, uh, Avatar Two and Avatar Three, which are both being done at the same time are both being shot on the Venice that uh, I think Sony is providing those cameras to uh, to them uh, to do the show, but the whole every- And not in 3D, there. right, Glenn? No 3D, no, right. just- <laughs> the, three, the 3D, if there is some, will be done synthesized later on, much yeah. simpler process. I, I think one of the things that is worth pointing out in discussion of why filmmakers like film is mm -hmm. there's just a lot less pyrotechnics and gack and stuff going on on set it's a film mm -hmm. camera you can't mess with it there's no imaging technician obviously there's some electronic displays that uh, allow the director to see what the camera is shooting but you spend more money on film and perhaps save money on time on set because of mucking around with electronic cameras yeah, and that was especially true back when you had the separate big two-inch machine, one-inch machine, and you had a, uh, you know, you had to have all kinds of technicians, the registration charts, and all the stuff yep. that you needed back in those days, and uh, now it's, uh, you know, the the video stuff is uh, like I enjoy. You know, it's funny how clients that we've dealt with for years will say, Glenn, don't you really miss that this isn't film or shooting, and um, I will frequently say, Oh yeah, but I'm really I don't miss it that much at all because 
there was always that feeling when you, when that film left that, my God, some kid that was going to high school is processing this in the middle of the night. So, I mean, this, this stuff is being touched by people that, um, that uh, may not have any concern for this and FedEx could lose it and all. I mean, it was always all that. You know, now when we record a, 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 everything that we shoot, like at a hospital, there's three separate full bandwidth recordings made at the same time, two separate uh, SD cards and uh, we're feeding a uh, non-compressed to a uh, one of these Atmos Shogun things and it's recording also. So we have uh, three three recordings that any one of them, if it was dead, we could get this footage back without any thought. So they all have the same time code. They all have the same audio. So anyway. Well, sort of belt and suspenders. Yeah, yeah, you're uh, you're you're getting things like that. I I wish that uh, I know a lot of these guys that there's 43 things in the chat. I I I can't re watch them or read them when I touch it, so uh, I don't know how that works. But well, anyway. um, I don't think many of them are addressing to uh, questions to you. Uh, I okay. mean, I see an R.I.P. Marty, and you know um things mm -hmm. uh, thanks glenn oh, okay. awesome session but right, they're great. really not questions all right know, good so good much. good i thought yes. we were skipping over somebody's question but uh, and everybody should know the we record these and these will be on youtube so if they missed anything they can uh, tell their friends and check it on youtube um i'd like to um bring this meeting to a close now if it's okay um you know the the next meeting and presentation will be in February. The date and topic is to be determined. Um, check with simpty.org or we'll be sending out notices here in the Pittsburgh section. Um, and you can see all the section meetings from all over the world on the Simpty website, as well as their on-demand sessions from the Advanced Technology Conference that was recently uh, held. and. Uh, Last but not least, I'd like to wish everyone happy holidays, and especially you, Glenn, for your great presentation. Oh. Thanks very oh. much. Yeah, thanks, thank Glenn. you, and, yeah, and I enjoyed, enjoyed meeting you guys, and uh, of course, I knew Ed before, and I enjoyed meeting you, George, so anyway. Yeah, we'll have to have a cup of coffee and talk more about adventures. That would be great. Yeah. That would be great, because uh, I, I got to, you know, we I talked briefly there with about Larry Thorpe, who is, is like a, uh, he, he's like an idol of mine. And uh, uh, once uh, John Humphrey dropped him off at our office and uh, I got to talk with him and then drove him out to the airport. And uh, he's just an amazing person that, uh, you know, the behind the scenes TV that people, you know, I hope appreciate the guy. Well, I know John uh, wants to turn this thing off, but I will say that I worked with Larry at RCA. Oh, did you? At RCA? Yeah. Good. Yeah, he was. Uh, he Thank had you, night, John. All right. Talk to you later. <laughs> Take care. Well, thanks, everybody. Right. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah. And uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. We had a great turnout tonight, and I appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to end right. the meeting now. And again, happy holidays. All right. Bye bye. Bye.